Day 558 of the Trump administration and day one of the Paul Manafort trial, the first big test for Robert Mueller. It is a trial about taxes and not Russia, though Russia looms large in the background, as it seems to in everything else these days. Manafort's being tried in federal court in Alexandria, Virginia. He was, of course, Trump's campaign chairman, ran the RNC convention. It's the first of two trials for him. In this one, he's looking at 18 counts of bank fraud, tax evasion, conspiracy charges in relation to his work for a pro-Russian party in Ukraine before he went to work for the Trump campaign. He has pleaded not guilty to all charges. This trial is off to a lightning start. So far, a jury has been seated, opening statements have been delivered, and a witness has testified all on day one. Manafort was a March to August chairman back in 2016. He helped Trump secure the nomination, make no mistake, and Trump said so at the time. I have fantastic people. Paul Manafort just came on. He's great. He didn't have to do this. Like, I don't have to. He didn't need to do this, but he wanted to. Paul Manafort has done an amazing job. He's here someplace. Where's Paul? <laughs> Paul Manafort. However, more recently, as Manafort was awaiting trial, the president sought to, shall we say, diminish his former campaign chairman's role. I know Mr. Manafort. I haven't spoken to him in a long time, but I know him. He was with the campaign, as you know, for a very short period of time. I tell you, I feel a little badly about it. They went back 12 years to get things that he did 12 years ago. You know, Paul Manafort worked for me for a very short period of time. He worked for me, what, for 49 days or something? A very short period of time. Manafort is the highest-ranking campaign figure charged so far. He was also part of that 2016 Trump Tower meeting when Donald Trump Jr. and Jared Kushner had those Russians come by. Also tonight... Multiple sources tell NBC News that Robert Mueller has referred another group of investigations to federal prosecutors up here in New York, the Southern District of New York. Those sources say that former lobbyist Tony Podesta, former Minnesota Republican Congressman Vin Weber, and former Obama White House counsel Greg Craig are all under federal investigation. The sources also say the inquiry into Tony Podesta, whose brother John ran the Clinton campaign, of course, stems from Mueller's investigation into the case of Paul Manafort. As the special counsel and his team continue their inquiries, the president is now embracing a new line of defense, as we covered here last night and as floated out yesterday by Rudy Giuliani. This morning, Trump wrote on Twitter, quote, collusion is not a crime, but that doesn't matter because there was no collusion except by crooked Hillary and the Democrats. Let us bring in our leadoff panel for a Tuesday night. Josh Gerstein was inside the courtroom today for today's proceedings. He is senior White House reporter for Politico, also our very newest MSNBC contributor. Cynthia Oxney is back with us, a former federal prosecutor and a veteran of the Civil Rights Division at DOJ. And Sam Stein is back with us, politics editor at The Daily Beast. Uh, so, Josh, tone and tenor of day one so far, what was the dynamic uh, like in the courtroom? Well, uh, it was quite surprising, I think, to see the uh, vigor with which uh, Rick Gase was uh, thrown under the bus uh, by Paul Manafort's campaign team, I should say his defense team. We were all expecting uh, that there would be an effort to dirty Gates up as a witness. Uh, but to suggest, uh, as Manafort's attorneys did, that the entire enterprise that the government was alleging, essentially all of the fraud, uh, the whole special counsel case stands on the shoulders of Rick Gates, was a rather startling uh, argument to hear uh, from Manafort's team. And that was, in fact, the central uh, thrust of their defense. We had a pretty good sense of what prosecutors were going to say and, and how they were going to blame Manafort for what took place here and describe the luxury goods uh, that he was indulging in and often paying for uh, with transfers that came directly from uh, bank accounts in shell company names. Uh, in places like Cyprus and the Grenadines. But uh, the defense was a little more uh, surprising, and, and they made this argument that somehow uh, Manafort's deputy had duped him into any wrongdoing that took place. Uh, they're listing all the items of his lavish lifestyle. The big one that broke through today in the news media was a, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, $15,000 ostrich jacket. Of course, who among us hasn't owned one of those in the past? Right. And the, the, the sums are significant, especially when you add, add them up. I mean, the ostrich jacket is uh, a colorful item, uh, but they're talking about him spending uh, 
something on the order of maybe 800,000 or a million dollars uh, on suits over a few few years period. So uh, it's a pretty dramatic level of spending. Uh, the suit he was wearing in the courtroom today did not look quite as fancy. Uh, Cynthia, I have two questions lead off for you. One is purely mechanical. Uh, I've covered a number of trials. I think we've all been on jury duty. How in the world did they seat a jury, have opening statements, and already hear from one witness in the course of a day? Well, it's the Eastern District of Virginia, and they're not fooling around. I mean, they're not, they're called the rocket docket for a reason. And usually, you know, after you seat the jury, you might have a little bit of a break. But no, it was stand up and let's do opening statements and then Call your first witness. That's just the way it goes in the Eastern District of Virginia. A second question to you is about this defense case. How tough is it? We just heard Josh uh, lay out the fact that they're going to go after the star witness. Well, yes, they are, um, because what else are they going to do? Uh, in prosecutorial circles all, all around the country, this would be referred to as the so die defense. Some other dude did it. <laughs> and uh, that's that's what we that's the sort of our shorthand. Uh, they don't really have much else to do. And the problem for them is it's a paper case, and Manafort's signature is all over things. And uh, it's not probably not going to work. It doesn't usually work, and I would doubt it works in this case. Uh, Sam, I want to read you a quote from Frank Bruni's uh, New York Times column entitled "Paul Manafort's Trial Is Donald Trump's Too." And the quote is: Manafort is such a gilded, sordid reminder of the company that Trump keeps and of how he sees and navigates the world. Uh, it is true, Sam, he has represented unsavories all over the world. It is also true this case is not about Russia, and it's yeah. true that Russia is the backdrop for all of it. Yeah, it's, it's, a weird, uh, it's a weird thing happening here in which you have, obviously, the former chairman of the Trump campaign uh, and, and right in the middle of a very high-profile, obviously, uh, controversial trial, and Donald Trump's name wasn't mentioned today. Robert Mueller's name wasn't mentioned today. This trial does not have to do uh, with any conduct in the 2016 campaign, uh, nor does Rick Gates' involvement uh, dovetail with what he did in the 2016 campaign or his work on the inaugural committee. It is a highly separate trial involving uh, past clients of Paul Manafort's, uh, and I think if we're reading between the lines, it is the prelude to something that's supposed to be bigger. Uh, obviously, uh, the prosecutors have a case that they're bringing here, but it does seem like they're looking down the road to try to get or compel Paul Manafort to participate in the larger mission, which is the investigation into collusion uh, in the Trump campaign. And we're all sort of waiting to see what Manafort does under this type of pressure. Uh, I do agree uh, that the case, the defense he's bringing, seems highly uncompelling. Uh, basically, he's saying my uh, underling did all this without my knowledge. Uh, Paul Manafort uh, is begging uh, the jury to believe a story. The prosecutors are telling them, here are the receipts. And so he's got a really bad card to play, and yet he's still playing it. And it all begs the question, why? What, why is he not trying to get some bigger deal done uh, with Robert Mueller's team? And I don't know if there are great answers to this other than he's waiting for potentially a pardon down the road. Hey there, I'm Chris Hayes from MSNBC. Thanks for watching MSNBC on YouTube. If you want to keep up to date with the videos we're putting out, you can click subscribe just below me or click over on this list to see lots of other great videos.